All right, I'm going to show you today from the scriptures that there is no eternal security in the time of Jacob's trouble, also known as the Great Tribulation, the book of Revelation, in other words. We're going to begin in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. You're going to need your King James Bible here, and I want you to turn to the scriptures. Don't just sit there watching me, okay? Turn to your King James Bible to Galatians 3, 28 and 29. It says here, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, female for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. There are there's no distinction between Jews and Gentiles right now. Okay? But if you go to Revelation chapter 7, Revelation chapter 7, turn there in your King James Bible. Real windy out here today. Revelation chapter 7 beginning in verse 1, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, till, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now you can make the argument that these men are sealed. Okay? Um, they are. They're sealed. They have eternal security, so to speak. Okay? But the average, the average, uh, the other people don't. Okay? Now, if you go down through verse 4, down through verse 8, it talks about the 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. All right? Uh, I thought there was neither Jew nor Greek. But now there's a distinction. Hmm. Verse 9. After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving, and honor and power and might be unto our God for ever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. Look at this. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Um, Christians do not wash their robes. I am washed in the blood of the Lamb. I am washed. I don't wash my robes, in other words. Jesus Christ purchases me with his blood, Acts chapter 20, 28. God purchased us with his own blood. I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb. I don't wash my robes. What is the action of washing your robe? That is, works. You see, in the time of Jacob's trouble that's coming, you have to believe in Jesus Christ by faith, because you're not going to see him until the end there. That is a whole other thing. But... You have to believe in him by faith, but you also have the second thing there of your salvation, and that is you can't take that mark of the beast. Hmm. Not true today. Let me show you some more scriptures. Hebrews chapter 3. You say, what would you say? I said, Hebrews chapter 3. Uh, I thought there was neither Jew nor Gentile, Jew nor Greek. i to apologize, my mouth isn't quite working. It's a little cold out here right now. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 3, verse 8 through 15. I should have a church building, you know, some big mortgage building and whatever else and force you people to pay for it. I'll tell you you're not good church members unless you, you know, support the work here or whatever else. <laughs> you know, some big church building that the Antichrist gets to take over eventually. That's brilliant. The whole world's going to worship the beast. You worship in buildings, church buildings. Hebrews chapter 3. It's over the head of some of the people out there. Verse 8. Harden not your hearts as in the, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Your fathers? Um, was it the Gentiles that were in the wilderness for 40 years? They got led out of Egypt? Uh, no, that would be the Jews. But I thought Galatians 3.28 said there's neither Jew nor Greek. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Then why on earth would there be a book written to Hebrews? Probably because there's a point in time when the body of Christ leaves and all you're dealing with then is the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. And there's a great multitude that could save out of every tongue, nation, people, kindred. Yeah, sure. But uh, you're dealing specifically with the Jews in that time. Why? Because they rejected Jesus Christ. And that's why the book of Revelation is written. It's there to show signs and wonders to the Jews to confirm the New Testament. 
It's really not that hard to figure out. Verse 10, Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do only err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into, into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Why would that be written to a Christian? If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. That's for New Testament Christian. This is not for a New Testament Christian. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Look at this. Verse 14, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. They have to hold the beginning of their confidence steadfast unto the end. Verse 15, While it is said... Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Hmm. Written to a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble, not to a Christian. That's why the book is called Hebrews. Matthew chapter 24. Turn to Matthew chapter 24. Lost posties like to go to this. The, the favorite passage of lost post tribbers is Matthew chapter 24. It's just like that's their gospel. You know, that's that's everything to them. You know, they don't even read the whole chapter. Don't even see who it's addressed to. But I'll show you. Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Endure what? Uh, well, we as Christians have to keep our testimony. We can't, um, you know have unbelief and we can't get messed up in sin or else we'll lose our salvation. Uh, no, that's not what the Bible teaches for a Christian today in the Pauline epistles. You're not going to see that. Okay, What you're seeing here is, he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. You're going to have to not take the mark. You're going to have to have the faith of Jesus even when the world's falling apart. And you realize the world's falling apart because back there in the church age before the rapture happened, I could have received Jesus Christ and I didn't. I could have gotten saved when it was easy to get saved. Back then, it would just been people making fun of me and casting out my name as evil and, you know, whatever. Now it's going to cost me my life. Now I'm going to be hunted down as, a, as an enemy of the state by the Antichrist. Yeah. You're going to have to keep that. You're going to have to endure unto the end. It doesn't mean you have to survive all seven years to be saved. All right? Verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached. We don't preach the gospel of the kingdom right now, but Jews will in that coming time. Why? Because they're looking for that king that they rejected, and they're looking for him. You see, they're going to be living under the Antichrist rule with his kingdom, and they're going to be saying, We have a king. Our Messiah is coming. He's coming back, and he's going to bring in his kingdom. That's why they're preaching the gospel of the kingdom. You won't find the gospel of the kingdom in any of the Pauline epistles. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Uh, what's a holy place for a Christian? Your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. There's no holy place for a Christian. There is no church building. But for a Jew, they have a sacred site over there in Jerusalem in which there's going to be a temple rebuilt. And that Antichrist is going to sit himself up in that. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Most post-tribbers don't. Verse 16. Here's another good one. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. What are Christians doing in Judea? Boy, it's a problem, isn't it? Hebrews chapter 4. Turn back to the book of Hebrews. Every self-righteous hypocrite out there loves the book of Hebrews to try and prove that you can lose your salvation. And every single one of them today believes that you can get it back. You can lose it and you can get it back. And you can lose it and you can get it back. 
you can backslide and then slide forward and then backslide and then slide forward and backslide and slide forward. And that's not at all what's going on in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 7. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, they, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Who's the people of God in, in context? It's the Jews. Hmm. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us therefore, let, you know, and by the way, so we'll see it says cease from his own works, okay? He that has entered into his rest, you're dead, in other words. He endured to the end. He also hath ceased from his own works. Endured to the end, you see? As God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Yeah. Works for a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble. Hebrews chapter 6. I'll show you a good one. This is where the uh, people today, the heretics today, go to, to prove that you can lose your salvation. But like I said, then they say that you can get it back. It's not what the Bible says. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. They receive the Holy Ghost. They're saved. Well, then they're eternally secure. Well, they would be today, but not in the time of Jacob's trouble. You see, today, we're one in Christ Jesus. We're Christians. I'm not a saved Gentile. I'm a Christian. Jews out there, you know, the Apostle Paul, he wasn't a saved Jew. He was a Christian. He's in Christ. I'm in Christ. We're one. You see? Time of Jacob's trouble? Nope. It's different then. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 and 20, through 27. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Does that mean that you do it at night, so, you know, as you see the day approaching, the morning? That's not what it's talking about. As you see the day approaching, it's talking about the second coming. You say, well, that would be a mysterious day. Well, not really. You can time it out if you go into the time of Jacob's trouble. Now that, you know, the Lord will shorten the days. He shortens the time a little bit, so you can't quite understand the exact timing. But you can certainly understand the year and the month. You might not know the day, but you're going to know the year and the month. Antichrist shows up, you say, okay, seven years. Yeah. Sits himself up in the temple, you say, okay, three and a half years left. Yeah, it's right there. And so they're exhorting one another as they see the day approaching. They're Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. Verse 26. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Have you sinned willfully after you got saved? Yeah. Read Romans chapter 7. Paul did too. He sinned willfully after he got saved. Well, then there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. And see, the little Bathics will come along that, that say that there's eternal security in every dispensation. And all throughout the Bible, it's eternal security. Uh, you know why they're saying that? Uh, because they're trying to get people ready for when they go into the time of Jacob's trouble, that they can all take the mark of the beast. And it's okay because we have eternal security. You see? They don't want you to understand in that time that's coming that you can lose your salvation. Because they're going into it. They're not saved. I can't lose my salvation because I'm not going to go into that time period. It's very interesting. James chapter 1. Turn over to the book of James. James chapter 1 verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. No, James, you're wrong. You see, because there's only one. We're all one in Christ. There is no Jew. There is no Greek. We're all just one in Christ. Uh, no, there's twelve tribes. When did the twelve tribes show up? Uh, that would be in the time of Jacob's trouble. Revelation chapter 7. Who's, who is James written to? 
the Jews, the nation of Israel. You can get instruction in righteousness, certainly. But doctrinally, it is for a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble. I've taught that for years and years and years. I still get people going, that's not true. Okay, uh, yes it is. James chapter 1, verse 22 through 27. But if ye be doers of the word and not but ye be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Huh. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. There's works involved in that time of Jacob's trouble. If any man among you seem to be religious and brileth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. You can talk the talk in that time that's coming, the time of Jacob's trouble, but there's going to be works involved. Huh. Verse 27, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fathers, fatherless and widows in their affliction. Read Matthew chapter 25 and how those people are judged at that point in time, the judgment of the nations. There's no faith involved. It's all works. Hmm. But look at verse, the end of verse 27 here in James chapter 1. And to keep himself unspotted from the world. Revelation chapter 20 talks about a mark upon the forehead. Huh. James chapter 2. Verse 14 through 26. What doth it profit, my brethren, that though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Can faith save you now? Yes. Can faith save you in the time of Jacob's trouble? No. No. Faith alone? No. Verse 15. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful for, to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. There's your faith alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works? You say, oh no, but Abraham was justified by faith. It says by works right there. Faith and works is what he had. It's not, well no, he was justified by faith, not by works. Or he was justified by works, not by faith. No, he had both. Okay, don't take passages out of Romans. I think it's chapter 4. It talks about Abraham being justified by faith and then ignore this. He was justified by works. It's both faith and works. He had faith that God himself would provide a lamb for the sacrifice. But he also took his son and put him on the altar and gathered the wood and was going to burn him, sacrifice him and burn him. Verse 22, Seest thou how faith wrought with works, uh, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. He said, See then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. You see, that's true of a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble. But now God doesn't say, Hey, uh, you put your faith in, in Jesus Christ on the cross, dying for, to pay for your sins. Yes, okay, do that, and I want you to go do this other thing here, and then we'll see. No. That doesn't work that way. Grace through faith. God's grace. Man's faith. God has grace for you as a sinner. You deserve hell. And you come to God in an act of faith and say, you know what? I know I deserve hell, but I want your grace, God, and I have faith that Jesus Christ's death on the cross is enough to pay for that. Will you please save me? I believe that you will. I believe that your word I believe what your word says about Jesus dying on the cross to pay for my sins. I believe that by faith. Yeah. Verse 25. 
Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Not true today, but it will be true in the time of Jacob's trouble. Finally, let's go to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation 14. If anybody is teaching you that salvation has always been the same, that it's always going to be the same, that there's always eternal security at all times from, from Genesis to Revelation, it's eternal security and it's by faith alone the whole time, you are dealing with a lost devil. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 through 12. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the ever, everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every peop, nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. No exceptions. You say, well, I'm a Christian. and I, uh, No, sorry. Christians aren't in that time. Well, I'm a saved Jew in that time, but I had to take the mark to feed my family. Sorry, you get God's wrath. You go to hell forever and burn forever, too. Verse 12, Revelation 14, verse 12. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Two things. Faith and works. Right there. You say, well, I don't believe it. Well, then you can't read plain English. Faith and works in the time of Jacob's trouble. And in that time period, if you take the mark, you lose your salvation. You don't endure to the end. You say, well, I, I, have a, I have to feed my family. I don't know what I'm going to... I just have to take the mark. Then you lose your salvation. And once you take that mark, you can't say, hey, that was a mistake. I'm just going to cut my hand off or whatever else. That's another thing that demonic people come out with and, and try to teach. Uh, you take that mark. It's not just taking the mark. It's worshiping the beast and his image. And you do that, you are finished. It's not that way today for a Christian. So uh, be careful about the deceivers out there. The new IFB cult, satanic cult, a lot of the Baptists out there, hyper-dispensationalists, uh, there's a bunch of them out there that are teaching this thing of uh, salvation's always been the same. It's always grace through faith or faith alone or whatever else. Um, there's no works salvation at any time in the past or in the future. Uh, these people are dangerous. They're heretics. Uh, don't listen to them. So that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching.